Christ and eternal Father. I thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your power. Thank you for all that you've done for us. I thank you for how you have blessed us, how you've protected us, how you have promised us life eternal. I thank you for the assignment that you have given us, an assignment that we would stand before you and that we would be your servants. I ask you to help us to have the mindset to be faithful to you in all of our appointments and that we would realize that in being faithful to you, that's where our strength lies. That's where we're going to receive power. That's where we're going to see, receive what is necessary for us to spread your kingdom, to spread your rule, to spread your authority. Lord, I ask you to bless us, keep us, make your face shine upon us, be gracious to us. Give us what we need to please you in the way that you want to be pleased. That we would be able to understand that our job is to do what's necessary to please you. That our job is to encourage one another in the Lord who happens to be you. Lord, please let us not be those that feel like you've paid it all that you've done everything, that there is nothing for us to do. And we go to church, wave our hands in the air, sing, but yet when it comes down to service, you can't get any service from us. Lord, when we've done wrong and when we're in the wrong, correct us. Correct us, Lord. Correct us now while we're living. Don't let us go to our grave with something that is so against you that you will not accept us. Help us to have the mindset not to be conformed to this world, but to truly be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we will prove that we are acceptable, an acceptable priesthood to you. I ask these things. In the blessed name of your holy child, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, help us, lead us, guide us, strengthen us. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. We need, we need just a minute if you all will give it to us. I'm fine. With that, oh. I'm fine with that. Cause I, I always just go by what you say anyway. I believe in you. If you all will, if you'll go ahead and turn to Numbers chapter 3, that's where we're going to work from tonight, Numbers chapter 3, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to give us some information that we can use that can be beneficial to our world as we do the things that's necessary to lift up his holy and his righteous name. And I hope that every one of you all are doing well tonight. And as we have just a little slight something going on with technicalities, it seems like it'll be over in just a moment. And then I'll give you my announcement where the Lord has gave put a blessing on me today. And I definitely want to be able to share that with you all because uh, I'm grateful. And by me being grateful, I'll share that with you. So Numbers chapter 3, 
I'm going to have the black pill already ready. It'll talk to me, and it'll be able to show what we're going to deal with tonight. Again, Numbers chapter 3. That's what we're going to be working from tonight, and our topic for tonight is that the Lord's Messiah has a priesthood. I said the Lord's Messiah has a priesthood. We know about Aaron has a priesthood, but God's son has a priesthood. I want to tell you, those that have been with me and understand that I had some technical, little things like little technical difficulties and things that go on, and, and it seemed like I might have, but I probably did have a little, have a little discombobulation. I was coming home from work today, and you know, coming home, going to sit down and go over my message. And as I was turning into my subdivision, somebody decided to turn and make a left turn while I was making my left turn, but I had to right away, and they T-boned Tim. Bam! And hit Tim. And I, have, I wear a headset. It looks like a trucker's headset because my wife can hear me on it whenever I'm around noisy places. And I said, baby, I just got hit again. Did I say again? I just Because one time I got hit, somebody missed the vehicle, traffic had stopped, and the first car went around me really fast, and I, cause I thought it was going to hit me. And it's like, Whew! but then the other one, bam, and I was hit. And for a long time, I had to go through rehab and all of that kind of stuff. So this time, I have a bigger vehicle, and I was hit. And anyway... I don't think that I was hurt, but you really don't know. I've been hit five times. I've been hit. I didn't say I hit somebody five times. This, I guess, will be number six. So I'll know if the Lord will in the morning probably or the next day. But as of right now, I feel good. So I'm pretty sure that coming in and um, dealing with just little things, having to stand out there and do police reports and all of that, but I want you to know that God was gracious to me because I could have been taken out. Um, the person could have died. I, I wouldn't have wanted to see somebody die. Or, you know, just, just stuff. And then the attitude of the person was so unbecoming to righteousness. But I have to remember that I represent a priesthood. I have to remember that talking about a priesthood is not just something that I do when I come to the class. So I was able to explain this so those that have already been on hold for a while, they can un they can now have an idea of, okay, he has some stuff to go on, and I don't need them worrying about me. I, I feel good. As a matter of fact, watch when I start preaching. Amen to his everlasting name. Let's sit between the cherubim. We've covered in Chapter 2 the families. We've already covered, and I listen to myself teach on audio, on our audio site, which is uh, www.seekingthetruth.podbean.com, seekingthetruth, one word, .podbean.com. And I realized that when I was teaching about how the tabernacle was laid out, for somebody that wasn't there or didn't see it on the video, it makes it a little hard to, to envision. So what I need to do is say that the tabernacle, which is called the tent of meeting, is just like having a big rectangle with a little rectangle in the center of it, or actually close to one end of it. I'll say it that way. In that big rectangle, there's where the tabernacle is, and on the outside of the tent of meeting, which is inside the big complex. The complex is on the ground. The one that we call the tabernacle, uh, I don't want to say proper, because when I say proper, and like, and like, what do you mean? The Holy of Holies is inside of that rectangle. The big rectangle, little rectangle. Inside the little rectangle, that's the Holy of Holies, or you can call it the square. Then the, it spreads out to be big, and around it, there are three sides, north, east, south, and west. You would have Aaron, Moses. You would have the children of Aaron and Moses. They would be there 
on the east side. On the north side, on the south side, and on the west, you'd have other sons. The easiest way for me to remember that is my brother's initial is GKM. So guess what? The sons of the sons of Levi that get to be around the tabernacle, Gershom, Kohath, and Mirai, they actually are right there on each of the compass points of the temple complex. And then outside of there, you have the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. We've covered that, and if I need to do more, I can do it in a discussion. But today, I want us to go deeper. I want us to begin to look at the book of Numbers even more so as a picture of what we are supposed to be before the Most High to spread his kingdom. He was using that group and that setup to spread the kingdom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this black pill that I use and I'm going to let it read Numbers chapter 3. And then we'll go into discussing it, okay? Here we go. Read it for me now. Numbers, chapter 3. These also are the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day that the Lord spake with Moses in Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the priests which were anointed, whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. And Nadab and Abihu died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. And Eleazar and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron their father. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister unto him. And they shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service of the tabernacle. And they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And I, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. Mine shall they be. I am the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Number the children of Levi after the house of their fathers by their families. Every male from a month old and upward shalt thou number them. And Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord as he was commanded. And these were the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon and Kohath and Mirari. And these are the names of the sons of Gershon by their families, Libni and Shimei. And the sons of Kohath by their families, Amram and Izahar, Hebron and Uzziel. And the sons of Mirari by their families, Malai and Mushai. These are the families of the Levites, according to the house of their fathers. Of Gershon was the family of the Libnites and the family of the Shemites. These are the families of the Gershonites. Those that were numbered of them, according to the number of all the males, from a month old and upward, even those that were numbered of them, were 7,500. The families of the Gershonites shall pitch behind the tabernacle westward. And the chief of the house of the father of the Gershonites shall be Eliasaph, the son of Lael. And the charge of the sons of Gershon and the tabernacle of the congregation shall be the tabernacle and the tent, the covering thereof, and the hanging for the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the hangings of the court, and the curtain for the door of the court, which is by the tabernacle, and by the altar round about, and the cords of it for all the service thereof. 
And of Kohath was the family of the Amramites, and the family of the Izaharites, and the family of the Hebronites, and the family of the Uzielites. These are the families of the Kohathites. In the number of all the males from a month old and upward were 8,600 keeping the charge of the sanctuary. The families of the sons of Kohath shall pitch on the side of the tabernacle southward. And the chief of the house of the father of the families of the Kohathites shall be Elizaphan, the son of Oziel. And their charge shall be the ark, and the table, and the candlestick, and the altars, and the vessels of the sanctuary wherewith they minister, and the hanging, and all the service thereof. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, shall be chief over the chief of the Levites, and have the oversight of them that keep the charge of the sanctuary. Of Mirari was the family of the Malites, and the family of the Mushites. These are the families of Mirari. And those that were numbered of them, according to the number of all the males, from a month old and upward, were six thousand and two hundred. And the chief of the house of the father of the families of Mirari was Zuriel, the son of Abihail. These shall pitch on the side of the tabernacle northward. And under the custody and charge of the sons of Merari shall be the boards of the tabernacle and the bars thereof, and the pillars thereof, and the sockets thereof, and all the vessels thereof, and all that serveth thereto. And the pillars of the court round about, and their sockets, and their pins, and their cords. But those that encamp before the tabernacle toward the east, even before the tabernacle of the congregation eastward, shall be Moses and Aaron and his sons, keeping the charge of the sanctuary for the charge of the children of Israel. I'm going to stop right there on the reading because I do not plan to cover all of chapter 3 today because I want to emphasize, I want to emphasize the priesthood in its work and that there is a work for those of us who say that we're in Christ, that we're in Messiah. It's easy to quote, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And most people that will quote that will never quote verse 9. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has ordained us to do. He ordained these works. What we're going to work with, if the Lord's will, is the first few verses in this up to 13. Somebody say you pick 13. That's a bad luck number. I don't care nothing about no bad luck number. I had a wreck today, and I'm doing, I feel like I'm doing fine right now, okay? Okay. I don't care about the bad luck. I care about the word of God. Listen to me. If we don't understand the priesthood, if we don't understand the kingdom, what we're going to end up doing is elevating preachers to a position of prominence and thinking that they can save us and thinking that if we are pleasing them, maybe they can elevate us to a position and give us a deaconship or something like that. And many times we wouldn't that get to be called deacons, wouldn't have been chosen in Acts chapter 6 to be a deacon to save our everlasting life. But what are, what are we talking about here in Numbers? Numbers is a part of what's going on in Deuteronomy. Not Deuteronomy, before Deuteronomy. Say it right, Tim. In the book of Exodus, when they build the temple, when we call it temple, it says tabernacle, it's really the word ohel, which is a tent. When it's the tent of the congregation, it's really the tent of the moed. And I need to say that because I'm not going to say it every time. The moed is a specific time. If you can remember back in Genesis chapter 1, around the 16th verse, when it says he set the sun, the moon, and the stars in there for times and for days and for seasons, it's for, it's for the moed. It was for what we call the place of meeting. And so when God had Moedim, that was called what we call the feast day because we get the English to say that. So the tent of meeting was a very important place in there. And so when they made the tent of meeting, you'll see that in Exodus chapter 40. You'll see in Leviticus chapter 8 and 9 that when they went in to do what was in Exodus chapter 40, it's the same thing. 
And you're going to read about the same thing taking place in Numbers so that you understand these books are integrated. Genesis is separate. No, uh, numbers come after that with another king that comes up in Egypt that don't know they don't know Moses. Yeah, they they, they didn't know or oh, didn't know Joseph. I, and don't let me say it wrong, you my friend. And uh, then and then you get Deuteronomy where the people have died. Let's go back to what we've just had. First thirteen verses. These are the generation. The word here is Toledot. Toledot Toledot means a written record. Sometimes in some places it wasn't a written record, but it was a genealogical record of the people. It's imperative for those of us that go out and we're going to be salt to the earth and light to the earth. When people start telling us, like a young man told me today, he told me I follow the great teacher, the master teacher, Malachi York. And that Malachi York said that the Bible is not really God's word and that the Quran is equal to it and something else. What happens? And he said the Bible came after Muhammad. And they're like, dude, man, how do you understand this? I know, obviously, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, you're, Muslim, you're ignorant. You're making an ignorant conjecture. I said, before there was ever the Christ born on earth. In a manger, we already had scripture. I said, Muhammad comes 600 years after that, and he plagiarizes the Bible and said, if you don't believe me, go to those that were before me. And I said, Malachi York was the individual that was locked up for molesting children in Eatonton, Georgia. I won't follow him, and I won't follow Muhammad marrying a six-year-old girl. I don't play that. He doesn't even know enough about the word of God to speak intelligently. But that word Toledoff lets you know that they had records of their genealogy. It's important because people say that the Bible is a tribal book. They say that the Bible been tampered with, and they don't know the makings of the Bible. They don't know the structure of the Bible. Now you have some people that do higher criticism and what is called lower criticism, and we're not going to go into the well-housing theory because guess what? Every one of these people, they have something to say that is contradictory to the Word of God. I want to see how you live. I want to see what you tell me about the origin of life, the meaning of life, where we get morality from, and our final destiny— I want to see how it comports, and I want you in the same thing to tell me epistemologically how do we know what we know about the world and what has to be in order for us to have a sun, a moon, a star, to be able to think, etc. When you give me a religion that can give me that and it comports, then we can discuss it and I can still show that the word of God overrides it. And I'm saying this for apologetic purposes for those that believe the Bible and you're out there, and people say, the Bible being tampered with, and they hadn't even read it. This fool hadn't even read it himself. And the Bible says, these are the Toledot, or the generations of Aaron and Moses. In the day Yahweh spoke with Moses in Mount Sinai. Let you know when it happened. Let you know where it happened. And said, these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn. We're going to talk about firstborn today. The firstborn in Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Aaron has four sons. It's important for us to understand Aaron had four sons, and it says, and in the names of the sons of Aaron, the priests. Aaron's sons were the priests. They were anointed whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. And one of the things that's important is that his sons were able to serve that word of minister. We might think preaching. No, it's to serve as a priest. That's what his sons were anointed to do. If we were going to go and spend the time, I would show you in Exodus 28, when the Most High determined that he was going to use Aaron and his sons to be priests. I want you to understand, listen, these are training wheels. These are types. These are shadows. These are figures of what is to come. God is going to anoint his son, and he's going to anoint sons. He's going to anoint people to minister to his priestly office. I want to kind of get you there, because if I spring, spring it on you in the end, it's like, ah. So I want you to be able to walk with me in it. Listen to verse 4. And Adab and Abihu, two of the four, died before Yahweh, when they offered strange fire before Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children, 
listen, and Eleazar and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of their father. What is being said here is this. Two of the four died. So let's look. Four fingers. One, two are gone, two are alive. But what you might miss in this is that they were cut off. Their seed were cut off. Where you get that from, Tim? And they had no children. Once you get familiar with the Hebrew scriptures, you'll begin to understand that's not a good thing that you're cut off without children. I understand men go make children everywhere and they go leave their children and the children pretty much is cut off to them, but that's not good either. But I want you to understand these sons were priests. These sons were cut off. So let's start looking at what we're dealing with so we're not just reading words. Can we do that? If you all will, let's go to the beautiful book of Leviticus, chapter 8, verse 30, and let's read the sweet word of God. The Bible says, and Moses took the anointing oil. I didn't tell you where we are. The sons of Levi, all four, and Aaron are getting ready to be anointed to be the priest that will guard the tabernacle, the priest guard the tabernacle against wickedness of men because of how they live, if they rape, if they rob, if they're blaspheming, they protect the priesthood, they protect the tabernacle from that because they tell other people what they're not supposed to do. The priests live according to Malachi 2 are supposed to keep wisdom and knowledge. Their job was to teach the other priests. Well, guess what? The priest's job also was to encamp around the tabernacle and anyone that was not dedicated, consecrated, or a Levite, if they touched it, they would have killed them. Listen to me. Priesthood duties it determines your life or death. Priesthood duty is a life and death job. Just like if an airplane pilot, he flies tomorrow. He's got your life and death in his hands. Somebody that might clean floors, they don't necessarily have your life and death in their hand. Somebody that builds skyscrapers, he takes his life and death in his hand. You drive Uber. Many jobs that we have is life and death, but when it comes to the priesthood, often we don't see that it's life and death. Ministers get up and they bobble, oh, bobble, oh, bobble, oh, shay, and they sprinkle their hand and push it down on the floor, and you act like you're full of the Holy Ghost. When does somebody push me on the floor and make me have the Holy Ghost? When will it make me be honest with my fellow man? When will it make me do right by somebody? When will it make me apologize when I'm wrong because you push me on the floor? Holy Spirit is not given by somebody going to just push me on the floor and say I'm slain in the Spirit. I want to be alive in the Spirit. Bless God's everlasting name. You should be able to have that now. The uh, 30th verse of Luke, uh, Leviticus 8, it has an L on it, and that's why I said Luke, okay? I, I'm getting older. And Moses took the anointing oil and of the blood, which was upon the altar, and sprinkled it upon Aaron and his garments, upon his sons, four of them, and his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron and his garments, and his sons' and his son's garments with him. When I say sanctified you all, please understand the Hebrew word there is kodesh. That means made them holy. So just sanctified, I need you to understand, because some people say, holiness is a way of life. Holiness is being set apart by God, whether it's a vessel, whether it's clothes, whether it's a bonnet, whatever it is, okay? Thank you. Verse 31, and Moses said unto Aaron and his son, all the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and there eat it with the bread in the basket of the consecration, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his son shall eat it. In other words, there is a sacrifice being made, and part of their job is to get to eat of the work that they did. And Paul uses this, that when the ox tread out the corn, you don't muzzle the ox. Then he said, did he say it for the oxes only? No. He said, those that thresh, talking about ministers, should plow in hope, they shall reap in hope. 
Listen to verse 32. And that which remaineth of the flesh and of the bread you shall burn with fire. I wanted you to get verse 33. It's important. Very important. It says, and you shall not go out of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your consecration be it in. For seven days he shall consecrate you. What is happening when I taught the book of Leviticus? When God gets ready to put them in position, he gives them seven whole days of going through what you need to do to be sanctified, to be set apart, and to be consecrated. And you have to stay within that complex for seven days and don't come out. Do not get contaminated. You stay inside of this place just like I had the children of Israel that stay inside of that house till the lamb, I mean, till the, till the death angel pass over. You stay in there, eat the lamb, and you eat it, and you don't break the bones, and you just eat the meat thereof, okay? In this case, you stay here till you're consecrated. Verse 36, listen. I better read 35 one more time. 30, I'm going I'm to read it again, 34 and 35. As he has done this day, Yahweh has commanded to do to make atonement for you. Therefore, you shall abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord that ye die not. For well, so I have commanded. You see, when you start telling people you can live any kind of way you want to when you're anointed and you're appointed before God, you don't even see this here. I have spent these days here consecrating you. The oil has been poured on you, but you better do what I say because I've given you a work. You are my workmanship. I've given you a job to do. I'm getting ready to elevate you to the position of authority, and because I'm positioning you in authority, you have greater responsibility on you. Don't go out and get defiled, lest you die. This is a serious business. Listen to the next verse. Verse 35, therefore you shall abide at the, tabern the, the, the tabernacle of the congregation day and night. Keep the charge of the Lord that you die not for. So I have commanded, so Aaron and his sons did all the things which Yahweh commanded by the hand of Moses. Listen to verse 1 of chapter 9. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the children of Israel. And he says, and he tells them to take the animal that they're going to do for sacrifice. Let's drop down to Leviticus 9 and 23. Why did you skip him? Do you want me to take three hours to teach the class? I think not. In the 23rd verse, same continuation of what's taking place. They are being consecrated on the eighth day. Now, now they've been consecrated. Now in the consecration, they're getting ready to do the service of Yah. Verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went to the tabernacle of the congregation. And he came out and blessed the people. And the glory of Yahweh appeared to all the people. And there came a fire out from before Yahweh and consumed upon the altar and the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. The fire was not something they lit. The fire was not something they came up with. The fire was not manufactured by tarrying. The fire was manufactured by singing. The fire came down because they were obedient. They did what he said. They did the way that he said. And he sent down his fire from heaven that consumed the altar. Now they got holy fire in the midst of the tabernacle. What I'm saying in the training wheels. Why don't we obey God? Why don't we do like he said and let his fire come and light us up to have his zeal to do his will? But listen, it gets better. Verse 1 of chapter 10. It comes right after verse 24 of chapter 9. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, two guys that have been anointed. I didn't read, we skipped, where they put blood on the right ear and blood on the right thumb and a little blood on the right toe. And they had been anointed with oil. They had special garments that they wore. They had bonnets that they wore. 
everything they had on them were holy. They had become holy. They were anointed. They were appointed. They were ordained. They were the sons of Aaron and the nephew of Moses. These are important people. But notice this is that they took either one his censer, which represented prayer offering before God, and they put fire therein and put incense thereon. So you get, imagine you got your fire and you put your incense on it and the smoke go up. It says that they put incense thereon and offered strange fire before Yahweh, which he commanded them not. It says that so easily. If you don't read on the say, okay, so they, they did that. But the next verse says, And there went out a fire from Yahweh and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. These anointed men, these men that have been saved out of Egypt, these men that have seen Pharaoh put down, these men that have walked and been consecrated before God, they offered another form of religion. They offered another form of worship. God had told them how he wanted to be worshipped, and they came up with something else. God has already said, I suffer not a woman to teach on a usurp authority over a man. God has already told us not to bring in a strange doctrine. The Lord has already told us not to worship another God before him like Aaron did in the 30th chapter. And now what they're doing is another form of worship. We are going to include something else because long as we feel it, we're in the spirit. We're in the moment. We're caught up. Don't we see that this is what God did with David when they brought the ark of the coming it back and they brought it on a cart we're going to see that the sons of Levi are supposed to bring the ark of the covenant the Kohathites we're not going to talk about that deeply today we're going to find out that God does not play and we think we can get up here and preach and lay up with little boys and lay up with the women and preach that the covenant is the tithe and that we can teach the prosperity message and that we can teach you can live any kind of way you want to and all of your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven because the blood on the cross would go and read right now. I'm going to say it slowly so you can look it up. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. It says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit Mortify the deeds of the flesh. You shall live. Galatians chapter 6, 8, and 9 tells you that if you sow to the flesh of the flesh, you shall reap corruption. That's New Testament, saints. Because we're a priesthood. What we do matter. That's why James 3 says, don't be many teachers. Don't be many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is also a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. What do you mean, perfect man? You got to read all the way down to 17 and 18, and you'll find out when you have bitter and envy and strife in your heart, he says, glory not and lie not against the truth. For that wisdom does not come from above, but it is earthly, sensual, and devilish. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then peaceful, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy with good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now, get back to your sweet text. So God put them to death. I wanted us to see that. Let's go to Leviticus 10, verse 4. I want you to see this. This is important. So in chapter 10, verse 3, because I see I skipped that. Uh -huh. That was so ugly. It was. I know it. Don't let me be uh, ugly. I was you okay, yeah. you, you, you're my friend. You're my friend. And my help meet that's suitable for me. Now, it says in verse 2, let's read that again, because folk don't know this. And that went out from a fire from Yahweh. It's all caps, you all. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Yahweh. The Yahweh is behind the English. That's why I say Yahweh when it gets there. I ain't making it up. And it says, and devoured them, and they died before Yahweh. And Moses said to Aaron, this is that which Yahweh spake, saying, I, I want to check because sometimes when it's 
Lord, it'll be Adon. And I, I just that quickly, I look behind the English. It says, and Moses said unto Aaron, this is that which, he, which Yahweh spake, saying, I will be sanctified. I will be holy in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. God is glorified when he executes judgment on a wicked preacher. God is glorified when he executes his judgment on those that are in the priesthood. That includes us. When he brings his judgment on us and other people learn to fear, don't let that be the glory that God gets from you. And if you think I don't know what I'm talking about, go one day on your own time and read the book of Joshua chapter 7. I was going to say Judges. That's why I did that study. I wasn't trying to be pretty. So what happened in the book of Judges? I mean Joshua. Read about Achan. Read about what he is lying. Read about how the priesthood is supposed to diligently search and see who's a liar and who's not. And God tells Joshua to tell that rascal before they stone him to death. Give glory to God. Give God glory. Don't go to your grave acting like God did something wrong. And he says, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. We don't say, we come and we sing. We call ourselves holy. Baptist, Methodist, we call ourselves children of God, and we live any kind of way. Listen to this little short story to give you a mental break. Tim was out in the neighborhood talking to some people today. Me and one of them, 75, 171, and there's a woman out there, and he was talking about different things going on. I said, our neighborhoods are like they are because we men don't do what God says. It's because we, our neighborhood have left righteousness, and they have left God, and they have left his kingdom principles. And they say, you can't blame all black people for but, but that. I said, why? Why can't I blame us for what we've done? Well, the white people so and so and so and so. I said, do the white people make us practice ungodliness? Do they make us practice unrighteousness? That's the one thing that you can do. That when you got to do certain things with the law, said I said you can die. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Let us die. We will not bow. And God made Nebuchadnezzar change his everlasting mind with a little bit of influence of him seeing a fourth man in the fire that I'm sure he did not want to come out. I'm sure he didn't want that fourth one to come out. And they were talking about how they still can go and get women and stuff like that and trying to argue the Bible with me. But before I left, they had some humility. Why? Because God needs to be sanctified in my mouth. You need to be sanctified. I don't need them to be my friend. I need God. I need to be like Abraham. I would need it to be where sometimes maybe God would give somebody a, I mean, a vision or a dream and say, uh, Tim is a friend to God. Oh, that would be so exciting to hear that. And so the Bible says, I'll be sanctified in them that come nigh me. Church people, Israelites, people that claim to love the word, this hasn't changed. This can't be shaken. This is not just what you call Old Testament. This is why he tells you to present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. I'll be sanctified them to come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified in Aaron held his peace. Verse 4, and Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron. Now, the uncle of Aaron will also be the uncle of Moses, but... That's how he wanted to write it. That's how he wrote it. And said unto them, come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. Carry them from before the holy out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses said. Now notice, their coats are still intact. And said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons, he said to his brother and his nephews, Uncover not your head, don't you take your garment off as holy, neither tear your clothes in disgust, lest you die, and lest wrath come upon all the people, because now you're in a leadership position over them, and you're supposed to be guarding and if you let God's judgment that he has brought on this nation, on your sons, if you let it be that you have turned your back on God's judgment and you got a problem, now the tabernacle will be defiled and all of Israel will have to pay. Can you imagine God burn your children up 
in their clothes, and the clothes still good. The exact opposite would happen with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The ropes and things burnt off of them, and they were okay. But their clothes and their hose, and that was King James, so and their hose and, and all of that, that was still intact. He burnt them up. Take them out. Shake it out. Listen to him say it again. Verse 6, And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons, and cover not your head, neither rend your clothes lest you die, lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren of the whole house of Israel be well, the burning which the Lord has kindled. And you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation lest you die, for the anointing oil of Yahweh is upon you. And they did according to all of the word of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when, this is the time when you can't drink it, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generation, and that you may put difference between the holy and the unholy and the unclean and the clean. Somebody will say, Tim, why did you make that emphasis on when? Because I know what the Bible says. I know that the Bible allowed them to drink wine. And I know people don't like me saying it. Am I supposed to care, Andrina? I'm not supposed to care what they think. Let's go to Deuteronomy, just for the sake of somebody, because somebody hear me and they say, he's just coming up with stuff. When they were supposed to go to do the feast, this is in Deuteronomy after their children come into the land. I just want you to hear what the Lord tells them when it's a far away that they have to go. So the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse number 20, I'm going to read 24. 26 is what I want, but 24 gives the background without me telling it. And it says, and if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it. And if the place be too far from thee, which Yahweh, your Elohim, your Lord God, shall choose to set his name, when the Lord thy God has blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money, your animals, and bind up the money in your hand. Then you shall go to the place which the Lord shall choose. 26, listen to it. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatever your soul lusts after. He's not going to say women. He's going to tell you. Oxen, if you want to buy oxen and carry it, I mean, when you get their sheep, or for wine, yes, and the Hebrew word, ha yayin, that means the wine or the strong drink, ha shikar, that's fermented drink, beer, for whatsoever your soul desireth. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice in thine household, and the Levite which is in thy gates, and thou shalt not forsake him, for he has no part, nor inheritance with thee. I just want to tell you, it was not that you could take that scripture and say, a man can't have wine. It was when they were doing the service of God, don't have no mistakes. You think God didn't want you to have some kind of merriment? You think all the merriment is for the ungodly? Everything that God has, you all things are lawful for you, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for you, but you should not be brought under the power of any. Paul is quoting that same kind of stuff. It was lawful for them to have wine, but it wasn't expedient to do it in the work of God. And they become under the power of, and God put them to death. I hope that we are able to start looking at God's word and quit putting in stuff that comes from poor prohibition in the early 1900s. Bless God's everlasting name forever. I know what I'm talking about. And so he says, it burn them up. Let's go back to Numbers 3. I'm back at our text. So Nadab and Abihu, three, and I'm at the first fourth verse. And Nadab and Abihu died before Yahweh when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. They had no children. Eleazar and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron, their father. And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron, the priest. Aaron is the high priest. I could go back to Exodus 28 and read it, but I think most people should know that. If not, they can go and see what I'm saying is true. 
It says that they may minister unto him. That's very important that we get that, that they may minister unto Aaron. Aaron is the high priest. The priesthood is predicated on what he's doing. Please listen to me. Nidabinabi, who is dead, I'm going to say to you now that Aaron's priesthood was never to be an everlasting priesthood. It was to be a type and a shadow of what was to come. You're supposed to be able to look at their priesthood and see what they did and understand what it would be when you finally get to the place that God would send his true prophet. The prophet that Moses prophesied about in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and 15. When the time came that animals no longer are being sacrificed for the sins of man, when God finally sent someone that can really take away the sins of the world instead of just a day of atonement covering for it, covering the sin, and now they're going to be removed. Listen to what else it says. Verse number 7. And they shall keep his charge. Aaron had a charge of what he was to do. And the charge of the whole congregation, please listen, they had a charge to Aaron or the priesthood. And they had a duty to the people. Their duty was to do what Aaron told them. That was their job, to guard the temple to carry the vessels and things of the temple, which we'll talk about on Saturday, which is so beautiful because you're going to get to see people in the position of what we call angels or cherubim. It's going to be so awesome. And then they had another charge to teach the people and to correct the people. And if necessary, if they touch the tabernacle, put them to death. If they blaspheme God, put them to death. They had a job to make sure righteousness was in the land. Because they were going to conquer. And if there's a kingdom, they had no laws. If there's a kingdom, they had no rules. Everybody could do their own thing. And he wasn't going to allow that. There was no what you call separation between church and state. Because the separation between church and state now is not true. Because the state always wants to be inside of the church. They just don't want what you call the church inside of the state. They will come in and tell you, you got to do abortion. That you got to do support this and you got to do that. You can't speak on this political party, but if this political party is the one that's in favor, you can speak. I'm just telling you, that was not biblical. God never separated because the people that are in the church are the same people that are in the state. Come on, let's don't be stupid. Let's be real when it comes to God. So verse number seven, and to keep his charge, Numbers chapter three, seven, and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation or of meeting to do the service of the tabernacle. And they shall keep all of the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation. We're going to talk about the instruments. We're going to talk about the shovels. We're going to talk about the bowls. We're going to talk about the lampstand, the, ta uh, the, the table of incense. It's going to be important, but not right now. And the charge of the children of Israel to do the, ser to do the service of the tabernacle. Now we get to 9, which I'm going to cover those verses in verse 9. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and to his son. They are wholly given to him out of the children of Israel. Thanks, this is so important. Because in the training wheel cycle of God, or in the emphasis stage of his kingdom, the kingdom which we have before the Messiah comes to earth, is he's showing them how to rule the kingdom. But he's given them to a priesthood because they are a priesthood. So he has a high priest. And they are given to the high priest to be of service to the high priest to do their priestly function. We are given to a high priest to do our priestly function. So let's look and see how that works. Because once you go to the New Testament and they start telling you things and you don't understand what the priesthood was, you don't understand what the priesthood did, or oh, you're reading this something and you, a lot of times people say, well, the Spirit told me, or the Holy Spirit told me this. Let me tell you something. I pick up this book right here. There was a movie called Meteor Men starring Robert Townsend. 
Robert Townsend, a meteor, it was green. It hit the earth or something, and he touched the meteor, and it gave him powers. He could touch a book like this, and he would know it was in the book. And he touched the book that was, I think, Bruce Lee, martial arts, and now he could do martial arts. Let me tell you how people do the Bible. People would take the Bible, and then, oh, the Spirit told me, oh, the Spirit has taught me, I don't have to study. That's a damnable lie. The Bible tells you to study to show yourself approved unto God by workmen that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. And when the Messiah, Jesus, said that, he was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Now, let's listen to the Bible. Well, let's talk about this priesthood that's given to Aaron. It's very important that we understand that they were given to him for a reason. I want to show you how that works for us. We already know that Aaron's priesthood was given to him again to guard the facility, to keep it from being defiled and approached by something it shouldn't be, and to guard the people. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 5, and let's look at our priesthood. As a matter of fact, for just in case... Somebody don't know that Christ is our high priest. Let's roll backwards to verse 14. Can we do that? The Bible says in the fourth chapter, in the 14th verse, because we're going to go back to five. I just want to make the point, because a lot of things I know, when you teach, you need to make sure people know what you're saying. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing that we have a great high priest, we, what they call New Testament age, we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. But we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, which means he can be, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find Grace to help in time of need. Well, you see, under the Levit Leviticals, they couldn't just come up to the temple. They could not just go in and do anything they wanted to. We are able to do that. Listen to how the training wheels and numbers affects us today so that we can do kingdom work. Listen to the argument of the writer to the Hebrews. The Israelites, yes, it's to the Jew first, right? And also the Greek. Five and one, Hebrews. But every high priest taken from among men is ordained of men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed about with infirmity? That means he has his own affliction. And by reason hereof, he ought to, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sin. He's taken from among men to offer sacrifices for them, especially on the Day of Atonement, for them as well as himself, uh, himself, because he's a sinner. Listen to verse 4. And no man taketh his honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. Do you see the writer of Hebrews showing you that I'm going back to Aaron to make you understand that what a priesthood is all about, and they help you understand your position. Aaron was chosen by God in the 28th chapter of the book of Exodus. He didn't choose himself. Moses didn't choose him. The assembly didn't choose him. It was God that chose this man that at one time built a golden calf. Oh, how good and then blessed and blessed is their unsearchable riches of God. And it says, no man, verse 4, take this honor to himself, but he that is called of God as were Aaron. So Christ glorified himself, you better hear this, but folks that don't believe that God the Father talks to God the Son, listen to what it says, for Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. I know that some people think that God made him the son, and that's when God became the father. If God is the everlasting father, if God is the eternal father, understand this. If God is the eternal father, when was he not a father? If God is the eternal father, when was he not a father? 
And in order to be eternal father, he must have a what? He must have either a son or a daughter. Think it through. Just because when we have children, we think that the child comes after. It does in a sense, and in a sense, it doesn't. The son proceeds from the father. Oh, I wish we knew the word of God. Let me just keep reading. It, it may come out in the reading. Verse number six. As he says in another place, oh yeah, and when they say this day I have begotten thee, this is begotten from the dead. You will see the same thing in Romans chapter 1 verse 3. He begets him from the dead as the first fruits of them that slept, okay? He has been born from the dead. I know what I'm talking about. Verse number 6, as he says in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears to him that was able to save him from death. When Christ did that, there was somebody that could save him from death. He is a real person, and he was heard in that he feared. And though he were a son, listen, yet learned he obedience through the things which he has suffered. Somebody, that is God, was so infused with man. And so he had laid himself or made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. So much so that he didn't have and use it. Well, he did. He had, but he did not use his God-like powers and had to learn. He learned obedience through the things which he suffered and being made perfect. Yes, being made perfect or complete, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. When Aaron was consecrated those seven days, when his sons were consecrated those seven days, they learned obedience, they learned to be sanctified, and they learned that they could do what God said, and they were made complete in their position through the things that they went through. Understand what they went through is nothing like what the Christ went through, but they did have to go through a period. They did have to go through it. This is consecration before God to be pulled away from everybody else. Then it says, verse 10, called of God, a high priest of the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. I could go on and read about how people are not smart and become dull of hearing and need to be taught again, but I'm going to move to chapter 7, verse 1, because it's still talking about Melchizedek making my point. But it's Melchizedek that's in Genesis chapter 14 when Abraham had finished the war and it saved Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Melchizedek comes. They have bread and wine. And Sodom, the king of Sodom wants the soul. But listen to Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, we're talking about the priesthood being given to Aaron, and I'm talking about we being a priesthood given to the Christ, and he's explaining priesthood, now he's explaining Christ's priesthood being better than Aaron's. Listen, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all being by interpretation king of righteousness after that king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, abideth a priest forever. Now, verse 4, consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoil, and verily they Listen, verse 5, this is important, red star flag, it beep, beep, oh, 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 oh. okay, and verily they that are the sons of Levi receive the office of priesthood, have commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham, who, but he whose descent, talking about Christ, is not counted from them. Christ's descent is not from Levi. He whose descent is not from them receives tithes of Abraham. Well, this is Melchizedek. Then it'll go back to Christ. I'm sorry. Thank you for being on it with me. And blessed him that had the promises. And without contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. In other words, Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them to whom it witness he liveth. Now listen to verse 9. And he was yet, talking about Levi, 
Notice verse 9, and I may say Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham. How can Levi pay tithes in Abraham? Levi doesn't come next. Isaac come next. Isaac got to Isaac come Jacob a long time. Jacob got to be changed into Israel. And then Levi comes the third son. How is he paying tithes in Abraham? And Abraham is going the way of all the earth. Unless the son is in the father and he proceeds forth. But Levi is not Abraham. <laughs> Levi is not Isaac. <laughs> Levi is not Jacob. But, but, but. Their DNA, some of who they are are in him, but not as the individual entity. That's why Levi can be called the son of Israel. He can be called the son of Abraham. He can be called the son of Isaac. I just want you to see how the Bible talks. I ain't making it up as I go. But yet, verse 10, he was in the loins of his father. And don't tell me that you think that means he was in the sperm of Abraham when Abraham met Melchizedek, and that sperm lasted all that long, because if that's what you're going to tell me, how did the sperm get out of Abraham and get into Israel and then get into Leah? That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that from his loins, the very thing when he told Eliezer, put your hand under my thigh. And swear unto me, because God has promised I'm going to have seed. And because and through my loins, this is where it's going to come from. Let's don't be a stupid when it comes to God. Let's don't be stupid. He's trying to teach us something. Verse 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? What need if there's going to be another one? There will come a time you don't have to surround the tabernacle. There will be another time you won't have to have a priesthood that's going out here to teach the other Levites. All of you are going to be my priest because verse number 12 says, for the priesthood be in chains. There is also made a necessity of change of law. For he of whom these things spoken pertaineth to another tribe, which no man gave attendance at the altar. There was no other people around the altar, no other people around the tabernacle but Levi. Verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest who is not made after the law of a carnal commandment in other words, you die your son, you die your son, you die your son after the carnal commandment but after the power of an endless life. For he testifies, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, I tell you, I would love to go in it all the way, but I, I, I'm just going to tell you, as you see these things, you're going to see that under the new priesthood, he writes the laws in your hearts. He writes the laws in your mind, and you all are going to be able to keep them, and you're going to know him from the least to the greatest. You won't need some kind of super-duper guru. What you're going to do is you're going to have God's word. It's not going to be written in your heart and your mind if you don't study and you don't learn it. But these people, this is written to Hebrew people that were already memorizing the scripture, didn't know what it meant. We got to enter into what they entered into. And when we enter into what they enter into, we begin to learn. Now, I want you to see something. One of the problems that we have is that we don't understand God's word because most of the time we don't read it. We've heard people tell us stuff over the years, but we don't know what we're talking about a lot of times. Let's look at one more sweet verse before I, want to, before I squeeze the juice. Let's look at verse number 28 of the seventh chapter since we were still in Hebrews. For the law maketh me and high priest which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, we swear you'll be a, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Now the things which we have spoken, this is a psalm, this is Hebrew 8 and 1, we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in high, or in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle. 
See, Eric can never go to the true tabernacle. He's a human. Eliezer cannot do it. But this man being raised up in the clouds, Daniel 7, 13, he goes on. Oh, God, I wish we loved the word of God. And so the Bible says in verse 3, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to offer, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve as an example. That's the point I'm showing you. They serve as an example and a shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished by God when he was about to make the tabernacle. See, saith he, make all things according to the pattern which was showed to thee in the mount. But now Christ, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry and how he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. I'm going to stop with that, and I'm going to take you and show you our priesthood in him. Let's go to Revelation. Why are we going to Revelation? Why did you stop? Because I would have to read, to be to be faithful, chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and people don't want to hear that. So let's do it a shortcut, and let's go to the book of the Revelation. I want to look at chapter 1, verse 1. I was going to do 5. I'm going to read 1, verse 1, because I want us to see that we are now the priesthood. He chose 12, just like there were 12 of the children of Israel. He chose 12. Then he had other 70. Yes, he did. He sent out other 70s. He sent them out two by two. And now we, as being the royal priesthood that I talked about Saturday, we are supposed to be committed to him. Let's look at it. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Get that? To show unto his service. What service? I'm talking about the priesthood. Watch me. Watch and see don't these bonds say these service be the priesthood. To show in his service the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth. Learn to read and hear it the word of his prophecy. And keep. Don't leave out keep. You got to do it. These things which are written therein. Well, the time is at hand. Folk that don't know about 70 AD, they don't know that the time was at hand for them to be destroyed and the temple will be destroyed, but we're not going to go into that right now. Then verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which was and which is and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Verse 5, that's how you get to verse 5. And all these ands, and then you get to the main one. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness or the faithful martyr and the first begotten of the dead. I want you to understand that word, the Greek word under that is protocols. Protocols mean the firstborn. It's important that you hear me say it's the firstborn, the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And have made us kings. The Greek word under here is basileia. Basileia, you'll see in most translations, it'll say kingdom. If you don't want to accept that it says kingdom, you can do that and think we got all kind of kings in the kingdom. You can do that. You're still going to get the thrust of what's being said. He has made us kings and priests. That's how you'd be a royal priesthood. Kings, he's made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory. Remember when God killed Nadab and Abihu? Don't tear your clothes. God will be glorified. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. I submit to you that we are the priests of God. We are the royal priesthood. We are supposed to be his servants. And in being his servants and understanding what it is to be a priesthood, what are we to do? How are we to live? What do we get? What's the big deal? Well, just first of all, just to know it ought to be exciting. But let's go back and look at verse 12. I mean, go back to Numbers, because we're about through with Numbers. Because remember, I said I was going to stop at 13. I'm going to go back to 9, and then I'm going to read the 13. And then I'll, from there, finish developing what I want us to know, because 
I want us to know what we're reading in Numbers. I want us to know what our position is. Our position is not to just go to church and clap our hands and sing and let somebody fuss at you because you didn't come to church today or you didn't come to church last week or somebody tell you that if you don't come to church, you're going to hell. Uh, really? Really? Show me somewhere where they, went to, where they went to church every Sunday and when they miss one. I bet you won't find it. But anyway, I'm not saying not to be faithful because you should be faithful to assemble with one another. But if that's the thrust of your ministry instead of the thrust of building the kingdom, why don't you revise it and make it more like the Bible? Verse number nine. And thou shalt give to the Levites to Aaron and to his son. They are wholly given to him out of the children of Israel. The children of Israel were to follow Aaron. They were supposed to do his will. Aaron's will to be God's will to conquer and have kingdom rule over the nation. Verse 10, and you shall, appoint, you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office, and the stranger that come if not shall be put to death. 11, and Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all of the firstborn. Get it? That opened the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. Because all the firstborn of mine were on the day I smote all the firstborn in, in the land of Egypt, I hallowed, I holied, that's what that word Kadesh is, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They are mine. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Let's end our message on what is the firstborn. You see, the firstborn is preeminent. The firstborn is the one that we see in the shadow or the concreteness. They are the ones that kept order. They are the ones that kept the law. Now, and what I mean law if we had gone through Exodus first, they would tell you what to do if a person steal. They would tell you what to do if a person murder. They would tell you what to do if somebody set somebody's property on fire. They would tell you if somebody bust somebody in the eye. They would tell you what to do if somebody broke somebody's tooth. They would tell you what to do if somebody raped. They would tell, they would tell you what thus said the Lord, and they would enforce it. And you would have a nation that would have peace. It would have the peace with God. And having peace with God, you would have peace with one another, and you were supposed to go in and give other nations these laws so that they wouldn't have all this raping, robbing, pillaging, sodomite, pedophilia, and all of this, and God would be glorified in the earth. But when the salt is lost, it's savor. Who do you think Messiah was talking to? He wasn't talking to the Europeans. He wasn't talking to the Asians. He was talking to the Israelites. You were supposed to be the doggone salt of the earth, but you lost your savor. You had savor when God gave you his law. You had savor when you were walking and doing what God had told you through Aaron. Listen to what we have promised. Let's make this quick. Romans 8, 14. I want you to see what it means to be the firstborn. Firstborn sons of God. And then when I finish, I'm gonna, this book, I'm going to give this book away. Uh, I'm going to tell you about it when I finish. It says, for as many, Romans 8 and 14, are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We are going to be having this, and think that's the Spirit of God. As we move through this number, we're going to see that the Spirit of God was set down on the place as a cloud, and that he would be in the cloud, and he would lead them. They would come and go, and the Levites are going to have a great part to do with it. I'm going to have you to understand when you learn to obey God's word, you're going to be led by the Spirit of God. John 6, 63, the Messiah, Jesus said, it is the Spirit that quickens the flesh, prophets, nothing, the words that I speak unto you. They are what? Spirit and life. golly, I don't even have to finish quoting it. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The first adoption that you see is in uh, Exodus 4.22. I can remember the, the verse and the address. I can remember the book where he says, Israel is my son, my firstborn, adoption. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Please listen to this. If children then heirs, heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ, they were going to inherit the land. We are supposed to be in the position that they were in. If we're children of God, 
heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we'll be glorified together. I want you to understand that if we are the children of God, we are heirs of God. But you may say, Tim, it can't be true because that's the position of the children of Israel. What I want you to understand is deeper than that. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, and then I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, God tells Abram, I'm going to bless your seed like the stars of the heaven and all of this. And he said, I don't have no children. <laughs> and the Bible says in the 15th chapter, in the 5th verse of Genesis, and he brought him out, that's Abram, and said, look toward the heaven. Tell the stars if you be able to number them. And he said, so shall thy seed, Zerah is the Hebrew word, so shall thy seed be. I will submit to you when you look at the morphology. Morphology is when you just look and see if something is singular or plural. You see, the word wasp can be singular or plural. This word is singular. He's only talking about one. 18th verse. In the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed, singular, one, not seeds like a whole nation. Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt unto the great river to the river Euphrates. One more, Genesis 22 and 16, and I'm going to tie it together. In Genesis 22 and 16, Abraham had already offered Isaac as a sacrifice, and God had told him, hold your hand back. I know, you, I know what kind of man you are now. You didn't withhold your son. Now God is going to swear. And you'll read about that swearing in Hebrews 6, if you're familiar with Hebrews. God said, by myself I have sworn, save Yahweh, but because you have done this thing and not withheld thy son, Thy only son, uh, actually it's just only son is in italics, your only, and in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, singular again. And as the stars of heaven and the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed, listen, thy seed, singular, shall possess the gate of his enemies. Notice that singular. It didn't say their enemies. You got a you got an agreement there. You, with, with, so it says he's going to multiply. He's going to bless his singular seed. He will possess the gate of his enemy again, again. And in your seed singular, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed. But you know that don't mean much to people. But we need to go to Galatians chapter three, and now we're going to see how that, why I kept saying seed singular, seed singular. Third chapter, 16th verse. One of the problems that I had in growing up, I used to have people say, you don't do scholarship or you don't use books. But yet, you take a King James Bible. Well, I don't know where my other one is over there. A King James Bible, and you have scholars to translate that. That's not Hebrew you're reading. Uh-uh, that's not Hebrew. You read in English. There were 42 scholars that translated from Hebrew. From Greek and Aramaic. Not only that, they had different biases, but I still use it. That's one I use all of the time. But I want you to understand verbs matter in the Bible and nouns and plural and all of that matter. Let, let me let Paul show you in Galatians 3 and 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Back then he was saying, I'm going to multiply Christ as the stars of heaven. I'm going to let Christ possess the gates of his enemy. That's why it's important for you to know that you're going to be joint heirs with God in Christ. That's why it's important for you to know that Aaron is the high priest, and that's why he had that garment with all of the stones on it to represent everybody being on his heart. That's why he had everybody's name on his shoulder. It's because you are supposed to be in his priesthood. You serve him. How dare we not see that and know we're supposed to be in Christ and his priesthood? You want to say Christ did it all? Aaron didn't do it all? Aaron is the one that's in 
because Aaron is the one that's got the load on him, but he has a helper. Christ has helpers. Join Aaron with God and with Christ. Read to him. Verse 16 again. 3 and 16. Remember that like you remember John 3, 16. Galatians 3 and 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, and not to seeds as of many, but as one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant was confirmed before God in Christ. The law, which was 430 years later or after, cannot disannul, for it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance was of the law, it is of no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And if I were to read on, I would tell you certain things about the law that was added, and I would show you that it's the works of the law, and it's the parts of the law that is ceremonial in the, in the form of animals, but I'm going to tell you that the moral construct of the holiness of God never leaves, never, never, ever, ever leaves. It's written on your heart and in your mind. If you don't believe nothing else, I say, why is he writing on your heart and on your mind if it's done away with? And why is Romans chapter 8 verse 4, slow it down, Tim? Why does it say that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit? Hmm? Tell Tim, because the Bible is right. Now listen, verse chapter, verse 26 of chapter 3. For you are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. This is how we get the inheritance. It says, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, born nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. Do you understand what has just been said here? Here is the man that said the seed is singular. And now he comes down and says, if you are, if you be Christ, that's with the possessive, then are you Abraham's seed. That is a noun, guess what, and it's singular. And instead of using the Hebrew word zera, he uses the Greek word sperma. You ever heard of the word sperm? We think of sperm, we think of sex, but sperm is seed. Romans 8, 28. Again, let's feel it. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Those of us that know the scripture that know if a man loves God, he'll keep his word. We already know this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. So you could easily read this and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God's word. Again, I'll say it again. If you love God according to John 14 and 21 and 14 and 23, you will keep his word. According to 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. So if you love God, you keep his commandments. So all things work together for your good if you call it according to his purpose. The Levites were called according to his purpose. Aaron was called according to his purpose. Christ is called according to his purpose, and he sends his Levites out. He sends his priesthood out to go and teach all nations. And then what the Levites did? That's what we do. We got to teach them to observe all things which he commanded. I know doctrine is hard to hear, but do you want to grow up or do we want to be like children? And then it says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that they might be the firstborn among many brethren. Did you get that? We should be conformed to the image of Christ. We should be conformed to the image of his son, who is the heir. Now, then he changed and starts seeing the firstborn, the preeminent. Listen to what happens in Colossians 1 and 15. It talks about Christ. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. When you think of firstborn as being firstborn, you're thinking wrong. Sometimes firstborn was that, but firstborn got to be preeminent. Because the firstborn in Israel case got to be Joseph. What? Yes. Because it could be moved and given to somebody else that position. Reuben had sex with his daddy's wife, and he was cut off from having that. Colossians 1 and 18. And Christ, and he is the head of the body. Please listen. 
who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. If he is the head of the body and the inheritance goes to Christ, and his seed shall possess the gates of his enemies, that's kingdom talk. If Christ is the seed and Christ is the firstborn, if we are in Christ, do you understand what it's saying? We have a real priesthood. We have a real high priest. We really have a kingdom that we should be upholding. And we want to, how are you going to let some entertain off the street come in and tell you how to run the priesthood? How are you going to let somebody that has been in the entertainment world or somebody come from another religion or somebody that's got a lot of money come in and rule the priesthood? That's unacceptable. But when you don't know God's will, you will do and say anything. Well, I just want to get to this last part. Go to Hebrews 12 and 18, and I want you to see our priesthood. I want you to see that under this priesthood, because a man was arguing with me today very, very vociferously, that the Old Testament is done away with, that we're just doing the new. And I said, why do they keep quoting it as written? Why do they keep quoting it as written? I should have said, why, why, why does the Bible say heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away? I should have quoted to him 119 Psalm, verse 19, uh, 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Hebrews 12 and 18, for you have not come to the mount, this is going back to Exodus 19, that cannot be touched and burned with fire, nor to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they heard and entreated that the word of God not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And so much as a beast touched through the mountain, they should be stoned or thrust through with the dark. And so terrible was the sight. Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you have come. Listen, this is what he's telling the people, the Hebrew people. It extends to us. We have come to Mount Zion. We don't have a tabernacle in Israel. You have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the assembly and church or ecclesia are called out of the firstborn. We have that Christ inheritance. We have that Levitical priesthood. We are dedicated to him inasmuch as the Levites were to Aaron, which are written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, which means he's taking the place of Moses now. Moses, you attribute him with being the mediator of what we call the old covenant, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood of sprinkling is speaking better things than Abel. Listen, see not that you refuse not him to speak it. For if they escape not, who refuse him to speak on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him to speak of heaven? We start teaching people it's easy with Jesus. No. 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 Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. Listen, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the uh, intent of our heart. That means he can check you out. Verse 13 said, neither is there anything that is hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him to whom we have to do. You should be more afraid of him than Aaron. But we get the teaching, you're saved, there's nothing to be afraid of. Read Hebrew slowly. Read it like you don't know how to read, like this. For ye are not come to the mount that might be touched. I'm, I'm serious. We, we have shortened Christ on what he would do. If I read it all through, it would go down and tell you our God is a consuming fire. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7, he's coming in flame and fire, taking vengeance on all those that know not God and obey not the gospel of God. And it didn't say if you're a Christian, you, you get to slip. Nay, to heaven, heaven, who was fully anointed and consecrated, he burnt them up. When we get to Numbers chapter 16, I want you to see him swallow some people and take them straight to hell. 
They don't even pass go. Well, Christ has a priesthood. He's made us a kingdom of priests. He is in charge like Aaron was in charge of the Levites. The Levites were in charge of the priesthood under Aaron. Aaron got his commission from God. Moses did the anointing. God allowed Aaron to go in and do the order. The priesthood was the central thing because God wanted to be center of your government. And in center of your government, I will tell you how to deal with man. I will tell you how to deal with me. I will tell you how to conquer land. I will tell you what to do when you conquer. I will tell you what to do about lending and borrowing. I will tell you how to worship me and what to do when you worship me. Aaron, your job is to do atonement for the people. You got them on your heart when you work, but not when you go in the high priest. They're on your garments. You represent all of them. It's a representative government. And then you got them on your shoulder. Then you have the priests that are around guarding the temple. And then you have the rest of the Levites that are around. And what they do is they teach the other people. Then you have the other tribes that will go out and be warriors on the other nations that will either destroy, execute God's judgment, or conquer the gates of Christ's enemies. And then when you conquer the gates of their enemies, you would enforce God's kingdom rule. When we come to what we call the New Testament, we think we got kingdom rule only in a church or only in our assembly. And we go to our job, we act like we don't have kingdom rule. We get to our home, we act like we don't have kingdom rule. We get on Facebook, we act like we don't have kingdom rule. We'll say some of any and everything. We'll slander people. We'll be inappropriate. We act as if we're not God's kingdom because somebody has told us you do church over here and you do that over there. You don't see that with Aaron. You don't see that with the priesthood. We hadn't gotten deep into it yet, but I need you to understand they were dedicated to do Aaron's work because Aaron's work was God's work. We're supposed to be dedicated to do Christ's work. We're supposed to occupy till he come. And if I was going to take time, I'm not to teach you about Luke chapter 12, but just read 12 and 48. The servant that knew his master's will and didn't do it. See what happened. Then see the one that didn't do it. See what happened. With that, I'm going to I'm going to close our, our teaching on this tonight, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to talk. I'm going to let people know about this book that I'm going to give away free. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for allowing me to teach a subject and a topic that I know about, but that you would have us to know about, so that we can see you more clearly love you more dearly and follow you more nearly and that we will know that we ought to be faithful to you and not to let somebody tell us that there is no work for us to do. As a priesthood, it's all about work. It's all about doing work for our high priest, not doing what we want to do or what he wants to do. And that priesthood is full of judgment, it's full of righteousness, and it's full of teaching. And the promise is to have you our inheritance. Bless our teachings, and help people to be provoked to go into it deeper. Pass this in the blessed name of your holy child, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. Now, this is a book. It's called The Myth of Eternal Security. I have a lot of books, some of them in duplicates, and I have some in quintuplets, and I was going to, I thought about selling them because a lot of times I didn't know anybody to give them to. I put them on eBay or something and sell them. And I told my wife about it. And we always, when we used to give away Bible encyclopedias. But now what, there are some people that listen to me in other countries. China shut down a lot of stuff over there. And uh, anyway, this book written by Mr. Dan Corner, it answers so many questions about eternal security. I have never met anyone, and when I say met, yes, I met this man. We uh, actually met him, got in touch with him, and went to Virginia, to Liberty University. We went there, and we did stuff. We did street preaching and stuff like that. We were able to do things, grow crowds and things, and they kicked us off of Liberty University for some of the things that we were saying because it was disturbing a lot of people because 
they really didn't know. For instance, this book will teach you about once saved, always saved. It'll teach you about how, let me just look at the table of context instead of going, because I got a bigger book, but I'm not ready to give it away yet, because I don't know if people really want, this is a smaller version of the super duper book. But it talks about can a righteous die spiritually? Uh, is eternal security the doctrine of demons? Uh, who's entrusted with the gospel? Is a Christian a sinner? Nothing but a sinner that fell down. Is eternal security another gospel? How will a Christian die because of sin? Does the seal of the Holy Spirit guarantee salvation? Uh, when a person turn away from God, does that really mean they were never saved? Is a Christian sin, and I, this is one really that I talk about a lot, chapter 28, page 167. A Christian's future sins are not automatically forgiven. And can a person backslide, page 188. And then 10 common misconceptions in page 211 about conditional security. And then the last one, 220. Is believing on Jesus the same thing as obeying him? And it has a huge scripture index. See? Just scriptures, what he does. He's very biblical. He's one of those people that, uh, he's very biblical. I just put it like that. He's very, very biblical. Uh, James White and some of the, what they call great apologists, don't even want to debate him. So the first person that just, tick, uh, not text me, but go to my message and say I want the book and put their address, I'll send it to you free. Just free. You decide you want to pay shipping, that's fine. But the book is free. If you don't want to pay shipping, it's free. I have more books. I forget to give them away because I got a lot of books in here, and my wife wants some of her room back. And I'm not going to be reading out of 10 or 12 different books. All right, so let's open our class for discussion. If there's any discussion to be had on our topic for tonight, any discussion. Okay, and I'll open up and see if there's any comment or question that has come from the, the live feed. Hello, I hear I hear a wind, but I don't hear a voice. Okay, I'm all I've just about got there. Okay. And I'll turn this down. I see three comments. Let me see. You're preaching, brother. Brother Roscoe, thank the Lord. Not just the old testament, it's the Bible. Amen. Woodrow Hankins, Elder Heath, I may see y'all Sunday for service. We'll be in Ohio. That that was something I need to read. <laughs> Here is the thing. When I taught the book of Leviticus, thanks if you never read the book of Leviticus, if you learn to read Leviticus 26, it'll open up your eyes to some things about the revelation. If you begin to understand that Exodus and Leviticus goes together, chapter 40, once they built the tabernacle, and it's really called the tent of meeting, but it's called... I just say I can. I, I don't know how that thing went up, and I was like, I didn't want to hear me laugh. But if you begin to see that this took place at the same time, Leviticus is what are they doing in that priesthood? You begin to start Leviticus. Remember when they first started talking about the sacrifice? They started talking about if a leader does wrong, you bring a whole bull. And you bring it in front of the people. You ain't going to be hiding your sin. When they see you bring that bull, they know you did something. And then if you're a lesser leader, you bring, I believe it is a goat or a sheep. And you have different things that you bring. They have certain things that you could do that what we call unclean that are not sin. They're not morally wrong. They were just infraction. 
I mean, do you think making love to your wife and some semen get on the bed that that's unrighteous? No, but you are unclean and you washed it even. But don't go up in the tabernacle with that. If you accidentally touch a dead body, you are unclean. That's not sinful. So people that make fun of the Bible, they you mix two different clothes. It, it doesn't. Listen, learn this. Learn what the Most High God say the penalty is for whatever sin it is. If he says it's death, it's death. If he says it's payback, it's payback. If he say wash and be clean, he will tell you the gravity of something. It doesn't matter what we think. This is his world. The Bible said the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. He determined what is a crime. There is no crime unless God says a crime. Understand that. There is no crime in this world unless God said it's a crime. Now, your government say it's one, but um, remember this. They killed Messiah. Rome said it's a crime to say you're a king. It wasn't a crime. So you... Israelites, by wicked hands, took and murdered the prince of life, and God overrode your judgment and raised him up and made him the head. And not only did he make him head of the corner, and just like the cornerstone, but there's no other name. Peter said, whereby you might be saved. Wasn't he bold? He went from the person, I come up, 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 and you up, 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 cussing that girl, cussing and swearing. I don't know, I don't know the man to the place he is. Whip us. Whip us. We, we, you decide whether we obey God or man. And that's what we're going to do. You decide. And they went away rejoicing because they were beaten. He changed. Start reading him in his epistle. And he said, well, you know, I've been told that the time of my decease is at hand. I ain't scared. I wasn't scared when I was laying down that night. I wasn't scared. Take me. But it's like, wake up, Peter. Wake up. You got more work to do. Can you imagine how exciting Peter must have been? I'm going to get my last night's sleep, and I'm going to get to go see the Lord, and then somebody wake you up. Most people wouldn't be able to sleep. Couldn't get it out of my mind. We have no comments tonight? All right. Join the parallel. Um. Between the Levitical priesthood and the Uh priesthood, showing that parallel and showing how the priests were given, the Levites and the priests were given to Aaron to help Aaron with the work. Likewise, I remember Christ saying that, you know. The Father's will is that I should lose none that he has given me. Right. And then in his high priestly prayer. I'm going to turn to it. called his high priestly prayer. Mm-hmm. In John 17, he talks about that. And he talks about those that you have given me, I have lost none. So you see in a sense that in, even when you were going through Hebrews and you went to Galatians, and I was thinking about... Um, Peter talking about us talking about us being a royal priesthood and being a part of the body. It is not something mystical. It is concrete because you you painting that picture for us. You showing us the concrete with the Levite, and you showing this. It was work to do, and it's not some mystical thing like oh. You know, I'm I'm gonna be I'm in Christ now. It's a body, and then I'm not talking about uh, flesh. I'm not that type of body. I'm talking about a political, social, tribal body. Martin Luther King a the, council. Martin Luther King to talk about body and say a body politic. Body, that's it. Yeah. So it's an understanding in that way makes a difference. If you stop seeing yourself as a political body or what or body politics or a council or a tribe or a nation, you won't act like one. You won't operate as one. You will all be individuals 
And then it's just like these churches when you went to Revelation, I thought about how he go to the church and he says he goes to the body and he says, Listen, it's we are we are members of his body. Where's that? And of his flesh and of his bones. Yes. So he goes to the churches and he's telling them, I have somewhat against you. Remove certain things and you'll be received. So you see individual whoever endures to the end, you get that, you get that. You I address you as the body. You are a body. You have to work together. Even when Paul was talking about, I know I'm jumping. That's okay. But, but even when Paul was talking about not discerning the body, he ain't talking about the body of Jesus, like his dead body on a cross and in heaven or whatever. He's talking about the body politic. He's talking about the people. You eating and drinking and some people ain't got nothing. Right, and, and you're drunk. And so, and folks saying it's wine with water, that's a lie. So he said, don't you have houses to do that in? You're not deserving about, you're not really, you don't go to Congress and go and you take a flask and you go drink while you in Congress, you know, and you, they, they may have a little. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Ted Kennedy, man, you ain't yeah, supposed to do don't, stuff. Don't be up in here drunk. No, especially me a visitor. And it's like, but this is what it is. It's for instruction. So you can go out and do. So you can know what he has commanded us. And that you need to go out there and teach others. So this is how you sit together and laws are made. Decisions are made. Judgments are made. None of this is being done in what we call churches. No. Because if you don't see it this way. Our slave owners. I'm telling you, folks don't want to hear me say it, but they've taught us, because they know many of us are what you call religious, they've taught us that the only way you get to do anything political or to deal with laws, it's got to be secular, but secular humanism is a religion. Yeah, they have a manifesto, one, two, and three, and I've read it, but... How are you going to let somebody tell you? That's like somebody told me, growing up, don't read the Apocrypha. Don't read the Apocrypha. And I'm like, what authority did they have? I didn't. I wouldn't have known any of the history of Alexander the Great and what he did to our people had I not gone and read the Maccabees on my own. And yeah, I plan to teach the book of Maccabees one day so that our people, people that listen to us, no matter what part of the world they're in, they can understand when Daniel talk about that spirit coming from Grisha. And they talk about the leopard with the wings so they can understand that God's word was fulfilled. But, Ann, when you're talking about we don't do the body politic, we don't think kingdom-mindedly, we don't, and we still feel like we got to be in our corner. Man told me today, we follow laws, we ain't got that God stuff. I said, let me tell you something. If you don't judge, I said, our slave owners would judge. The majority would judge. They will write laws tell you can't spit on the concrete. They will make laws you can't whip your child. They'll make laws you can only keep so much of your money. They'll make laws that say that your child, somebody can teach your child pedophilia, anal sex in the fifth grade because they were doing that back in Texas even about 12 years ago. They would teach you that you can't call your boy a boy at home because they want to pass the Equality Act. They can pass laws and say that you get locked up so long for stealing this. They'll pass laws that say you can be sold when you're in prison to do work. They make laws and the children of God supposed to sit back and wait on a rapture? Then we suppose we suppose the heaven has the earth. Why he told us to pray that? That's what they were doing. Their job was the heaven has the earth. Deuteronomy 6 and 4 that I've taught, 6 and 5, I've taught you laws and statutes and the commandments of God that you were to go in the land and do it. It will be to your wisdom and all of the nation will see and say what nation is that that have a God so near as that which we have. And they would come and learn. If you think I don't know what I'm talking Talking about during the days of Solomon, they came to learn, to hear, and to do. Nobody wants to hear our laws because often we got pedophiles in the church. We got pedophiles in the assembly. And we got people that live a wicked life and just because they sing and when they die, they're great. The church is, oh, I'm so crazy about Whitney Houston. She was a great woman. No, she wasn't a great woman of God. You are insult to women like Holder to say that. 
That's an insult to a woman, woman like Elizabeth. That's an insult to people like Darkus to take somebody that's been so outside of the will of God. I don't care if she repented before she died. There are different levels of work and of greatness that people have done for the people of God. When she died, all they started doing this to Peter. Look. 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 We don't want to rule, and we don't rule in our own home with righteousness. We rule on the man. I'm bigger than you. What if she buy a pistol? What What if she learn certain things about certain drugs or certain animals? You know that woman Lynn something that killed three different men? I think a, what was it, a policeman and two firemen? She put antifreeze in there and she killed three different civil servants and got their insurance? You Women can put you to death, big boy. What you think? Anyway, your scripture you were talking about was Ephesians 5 and 30, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And when we don't discern the body, we don't discern what he's doing. We we fail him. And I remember one day you got on to me because I would tell you about this man that I do work for. He was calling his people. He was F-bombing them. You know, F bombing this, F bombing that, lazy and lazy and, and all of that. And I was telling you I, I didn't like it and and, and and I told him I said, Well well I forgot what I said, but you said well, how did you tell me? What did you say? Use your words. I think you told me, um say you got it on the tip of your tongue. You said to Tim, and why don't you tell him like you tell everybody else? Aren't you supposed to be heavenizing the earth? I said, he'll do it again. Because I had made up my mind, if you do it you do it again, it's like I, I don't have to come back. Yeah, it's like I don't have to work for him. And I said, uh, these people work for you. You call them F and this and F and that and GD this or whatever, and I guess he think he impressed me. He oriental and they oriental. And then some of them he pay under the, he pay under the table. But anyway... Irrespective, I say this to him. I say, if you say that about them, what you say about me when I'm not around? Yeah, I ask him. Well, I won't be scared because I I got a mission now. I'm kingdom mission now. Right. So I say to him, I said, so these people, do you pay them for nothing? I'm saying, I'm saying, if they're not here, if one of them out, do you have to work more? Yeah. Do you have to be here all day if one of them's out? Yeah. What if none of them come? Will you be able to keep your business? No. So if you say they're lazy and do nothing, why is it you say when they're not here, you got one, just one of them not here? I'm going to tell you something. God don't like what you're doing. Are you slandering them before me and you saying stuff and you're accusing them of being lazy? And all, I said, you treat them more than likely like you talk about them. And I explained to him righteousness. I explained to him justice. I said, because when you tell me that, it's wrong. And I said, God say it. I don't care about your boot. I don't believe in him. He went, he, he went and got somebody else, and he left his wife and children. I don't follow him. He, he don't follow God. I say, you, you, how are you going to tell me you're a Buddhist and you're up here making money? You ain't supposed to desire anything. You're the same thing like a Christian hypocrite. I'm told about three or four people that, that you heard me talk to. Me, you? Or, you know, you were trying to compare your stuff to the word of God. But anyway, I said, if you treat them kindly and treat them with dignity, maybe they'll care more about your business. And he, and the next thing he did, he did it to me. Told me how good a work I did for him. And I hadn't talked to him again. I need to call him. It's time for me to, to transact business with him again. But I, tr I try to train him. You know, don't come to me denigrating people like that because I'm a kingdom representative. I'm an ambassador. And if you won't say it to me in front of them, or if you do say it to me in front of them, I still got a problem. Because I thought one time I was going to lose my job like that. You remember when I used to sell chemicals? And this woman came in chewing this man out, talking to him like he was a dog. And I said, I can't wait on you like that. I, I said, because I, I, I don't like the way you treat him. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just not going to be here while you disrespect him. Something like that, I said. I thought I might lose my job, but I was like, I don't care. It's just, you know, I had to work on my own anyway. I'm just saying, we're supposed to carry that. 
when we get scared, we're going to lose our job. Somebody going to be our friend. But if we're going to be, look, we're not Levites, but we're the priesthood. We can say we're Judahites. We got a different priesthood, a higher priesthood. We got a priest that don't have to go in only once a year on the Day of Atonement. We got one that's in the heavens now that has already received the kingdom, power, dominion, and authority that every nation bow to him, Daniel 7 and 13. He's given to us, Daniel 7 and 18, the saints are supposed to possess the kingdom, not in a rapture, now. now they had it now. How they going to have it now when we don't? Because somebody has told us that the rapture is going to come. Remember, I went to Bible college and I told you they taught me dispensations. Clarence Larkin they have all these kind of charts. And I got books up here, Jake Wright, Pentecost, Larkin. I got all that dispensational stuff. I ain't stupid when it comes to that. But I know for a fact that that stuff wasn't taught over 150 years ago. And secondarily, how Israel going to get one thing and the other people going to get something else when it's one olive tree? One olive tree, and they all become the Israel or the, or the stars of God. Israel is star like prince with God. How? We got to come home, especially we black people. That's what I was telling about in the neighborhood today. I was in the neighborhood where people would look, at, look down on that neighborhood. And it's like, we don't have to be like this. I said, if we turn to God, I said, if all of us were to walk with God, like he said, there is nothing that could be held back from us that he wants us to have. And then he went there and said, but y'all want to fornicate, adulterate, homosexuate, and then that man said, I ain't supposed to judge, but I do what's right. I said, so is it wrong for a little boy to live with another boy? I can't judge. This is a 71-year-old man. I can't judge. I can't say. I looked him deep in the eye. I said, and you're the problem. I said, you're the problem. Because you're, ba- well, I don't have a right. I said, but you don't. I said, that's not what God says. Before I left, they changed their tune. We've been taught to let some other people set the agenda of God's kingdom. We have to stop our mess. We might lose a job. We might lose a friend. But what, what friend would lead you to hell? I ain't fired you up to say something else. I was just thinking about, you know, when you look back, just you were talking about the guy and the way he treated his people. I think you mentioned to him about black people being in slavery. I did, yeah, I forgot that. Mistreated. And so that mistreatment. So when I think back about the 60s and, and you know, and before the, the unity that the church had in standing up against you know, these, what they call social problems, that they would come together, they would meet, they would have plans, they said, we're going to go out and we're going to uh, stop riding the bus, we're going to, you know, they had so much unity, they come together and pray and sing, they had so much unity, and then they got free, and then they integrated, and then what happens, you get the 70s, and the 70s is like, it's, it's done. Because you got all this, all this free love. It's like let's pour our culture onto them so much so that they won't be the same people. Because they were people who would come together. You can't do anything. You know, it's like you, they're gonna come together and they're gonna march. They're gonna say something. They're gonna pick it, and you know, they'll do something. That is gone. Everybody sit back and watch, and then they create these groups. And you think it okay, I'm gonna be this and it's like it has nothing to do with any real change in any policy. It has something to do with promoting something else wicked. And so it is like and they always want you to join a group like that. They'll say it's black, but it ain't black. It's about homosexuality. But you can join it and you can say, Well, you can join in with us because you black and say, you know, we the same. And it's like, no, we're not the same. And so that whole thing is like the church has no teeth. The church is dead. It is so dead. It is so dead. Why do you think that is? People, the, the very thing you just say, they teach the people you can't judge. You don't supposed to judge. Where do you get that from? Hell. Of course. 
I know that was rhetorical, but it just it still came out of my mouth. And I think it's like you said, the rapture holds the whole thing with the rapture dispensationalism is f that people not be king to mind them, people not come together and try to you know just to even deal with social ills and and deal with wretched ratchet laws you know that's being passed. I see some come together. I, I, the, um, I can't remember this bill that. Listen to what's his name? Um, Short, short. short. I like really short. Anybody, anybody. Look, I ain't gonna say I agree with all his doctrines, but when it comes to when it comes to dealing with stuff, you can look him up on YouTube. Randy Short. Go ahead, precious. So anyway, there were some that came together to stand up for that. For, uh, what was the name of the bill? You talking about the Equality Bill? Yeah, the Equality Act. Yeah. So they and I read it. That. And so, people are secularized. And it's, church is just some social event, like going out to eat or, you know, uh, having a party or it has no significance. It has no power. No power whatsoever. It exhibits none of the power that Christ has, none that his disciples have. It exhibits, and people think the power is, I want to be able to heal somebody. I wanna they do. To, I want to be able to speak in tongues. And it's like, what about speaking righteousness on the earth? What about displaying it? What about what it says, when your obedience is fulfilled, you demand obedience from everybody else? What happened to that? That's the power. The power is to change life and another change life and another change life that you multiply the kingdom and you multiply righteousness on the earth because he says he's going to be glorified here. It doesn't seem like it if it's left up to us. We got to teach it, whether anybody does it or not. Because the Bible says if you just teach the, look, if you teach this and you don't teach it, one is going to be called great in the kingdom of heaven, and one's going to be called least. Why is I want? Why you want to be great in mega church, but least in everything else? Look, until we learn how to rule, Sharia Muslims want to rule. Okay, yeah they do. The globalists want to rule. Yes, Marxists want to rule. Yes. Uh, Eastern religion want to rule. The Catholic Church want to rule. When are the people that say that God is our king going to act like our God is our king? And I'm going to be able to show as we go through numbers. I want to show that when it says in from the anger of the Lord and camp round about them that fear him to deliver them, I'm going to show you he was in the midst, but they say he camped round about them. I want us to understand he camped round about us. But you don't see the concrete. So what you do, you take scriptures and use them, and you divorce it from the economy of a righteousness. You divorce it from the economy of making it on earth as it is in heaven. Where is our salt? Where is our light? Where? Where is it? And it's a sickening thing. One of the things that I stopped reading on because I didn't want to go there, but what you're saying is when they talk about Melchizedek, in Hebrews 5 and 11, when people don't want to judge it, it's because they're babies. It's because they're babies. Babies don't want to judge righteously. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, when he's talking about Melchizedek, he says, I have other things to say of whom, talking about Melchizedek, of, of whom to say, of what to say, hard to be uttered. In other words, hard to explain, seeing you are dull of hearing. You are dull of hearing. In other words, you have made yourself slow, in the slow class. He said, for when the time you ought to be teachers, ought is, you are obliged to be a teacher by now. You have need that one teach you again. In other words, listen to the words. You ought, obliged. You have need. It's of necessity you in such bad shape. That one teach you again, which be the first principles. I mean, baby stuff. 
The same thing you tell your six and one you need to move from of the oracles of God and become. The word here is genomai. That means you have physically, you have mentally made yourself start all over. You become one that needs milk and not strong meat. But everyone that uses the milk is unskillful. That's why you can't explain the word. That's why you take every doctrine that comes from a book. Yeah, all the books I have, if I told everything, I'd be what they call schizophrenic. I have Satan's book, Marx's book, whatever, whatever. The thing is, is you're unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. Now listen to this. But strong meat belong to them that are of full age. Mature, that, what, the same word is perfect, okay? Behind the English, it could say perfect age, uh, mature. Even those who by reason of use or practice have their senses exercised to discern, listen, both good and evil. This is the very thing that it takes to be mature. Tim, how do you know that? You just saying something. You just always want to have something different. Well, let's see if strong meat belongs to those that can discern good and evil that have grown up. Listen to 1 Kings 3 and 8 when Solomon was made king. He's praying to God and say, thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which have you have chosen a great people. They can't be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. Between good and bad. Where do you get that from? Well, let's go back and look at verse 7. And now, O oh Yahweh, my God, you have made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. I am the equivalent of a baby. I don't know how to go in and come out. You put me in the midst of your people, a great people that can't be numbered for multitude. Give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and bad for us who, who is able to judge so, such great people. And shortly after that, the two whores came and he made the right judgment. And guess what? After he did righteous judgment because God had granted him to be able to have the maturity to judge, just like he made water in the wine, he skipped some steps and got him there and listened to what the psalm total of verse 28 of chapter 3 was after he did the judgment. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. You see, the discern between good and bad when God give it to you is a good thing. But when you want to know between good and evil, when it's outside of God's will, it's a bad thing. That's what happened with Eve. That's what happened with Laban. Laban was told when he caught up with Jacob the night before, don't say nothing to him good or bad in other words you can't pass judgment you can't discern between good and evil shut your mouth and i'm saying that we as the people of god we supposed to be discerning between good and evil for the world and they doing it for us how dare we say we God's priest? How dare we say he's his kingdom? How dare we say that Christ is our lawgiver and the scepter has never departed from his feet? We act like he doesn't have laws that are supposed to be written on our hearts and on our minds. And with that, I'm going to rest my throat. Is there anybody on the conference line that had anything they would want to add or take away to what, from what I've said? Because I'm, I'm enjoying myself. That don't mean nobody else is enjoying their self. Nobody? I know how to cut it off. May the Lord bless and keep us. Make his beautiful face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. And empower us with his will and his spirit. So that we can be faithful to him and that we can learn to be discern between good and evil and just lift his countenance upon us and give us his peace. Amen, amen, and even so, amen. I thank you all for joining us tonight. And we'll pick up on this on the on the caring and the moving of his flesh, him being with us, because he's gonna have his flesh 
in animals. I mean it in the sense animals are his. They are dead. Their body's going to be able to tabernacle. His spirit's going to be in that. He's going to give you a picture of what it's like in the future when he walks around as a man. It's going to be so good and so great. 